It is wonderful to be back in Amsterdam, um, particularly this week. Uh, I was here two years ago uh, with Yoev and Steve and a bunch of people um, drinking on election night after Velocity, and that election didn't go quite the way that I hoped. Um, so I came back with another election, and it was really, um, really agonizing. Um, but uh, it went much better this time, so I, I'm very, very glad to be back and to like to take all of the good memories of Amsterdam and like reinforce them. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, a situation that a couple of our clients have found themselves in, and that you may find yourself in at some point in the future. Um, and that's the presidents of the organization have gone to these clients and said, essentially, we need a progressive web app. And this is not typical, like it's not, it's not normal for an executive of an organization to go to the web team and essentially say that they need a particular technology. And the web team for these organizations is faced with a bunch of questions. Um, the, the product owner wonders, like, what is a progressive web app? Um, the project manager wonders how they create a plan for it. The business owner asks the question, like, do we even need a progressive web app? Um, the designer might wonder, like, how does the CEO even know about a progressive web app? And then the developer might be really excited. And like, okay, cool, I've been wanting to play with service workers and Vue.js, and like, maybe we could like, change everything around to use Node. And, and like, this team, with all these divergent perspectives, has to come together and put together some sort of plan, and they don't even have a common understanding of what it is that they're going to build. So I want to talk a little bit about that today, and then sort of where the opportunities are for people who are really interested in performance to use progressive web apps as a way to um, sort of push performance into organizations. Um, so let's start with the most pressing and difficult question to answer, perhaps, um, which is, uh, how in the world did the president even know about this? And the reason that they did is because the sorts of publications that they follow are talking about progressive web apps. Um, so articles in, in publications like Total Retail, which is focused on executives of retailers, or um, Digiday, which is something for advertisers. And, um, uh, and what's happening is that companies that have implemented progressive web apps are talking about how they're seeing increases in performance, but also increases in revenue, increases in conversion, increases in engagement. Ola Cabs, which is in India, um, they found that their progressive web app was smaller than their Android um, installation, and they were also seeing that 20% of the users were people who had previously uninstalled the native application in order to get more space on their phone, but now they were using the progressive web. So it's actually bringing customers back. Uh, Pinterest has published uh, two case studies, which are really great, talking about the sort of increases in ad revenue, increases in user engagement. Um, the most recent one that they wrote, which has been less than a month, they talked about how before they did their PWA, uh, that mobile web was the least likely way that somebody would come to become a Pinterest user, and now it is the most likely way to get a new user sign up. Um, pretty radical shift based on developing a progressive web app. We hear so many of these stories that we built this website, pwastats.com, where we keep track of this sort of stuff. It's, um, in many ways, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, we borrowed the idea from uh, uh, Tammy and Tim um, with WPO stats, um, but we wanted to do something similar for PWA stats. So if you're looking for ways to convince people inside your organization about progressive web apps, you can go there and you may be able to find um, somebody doing a similar competitor or something that's written about it. The next question that I want to answer is one that probably seems a little obvious, but actually isn't, um, and that is what is a progressive web app? Um, it should be obvious because um, progressive web apps were coined by Francis Berryman and Alex Russell, and when they um, described a series of characteristics of these new websites that they saw that were creating sort of native-like experiences on the web. And they had these 10 characteristics, that they were responsive, they were connectivity independent, um, they had network resiliency, they had app-like interactions, they were fresh, safe, discoverable, which meant that they declared themselves to be apps so that they could then be installed, use push notifications for re-engagement. Um, and these last two, I think, are actually the really important ones, um, that they're linkable and progressive. And it's important because we've had attempts in the past to use web technology to create app-like experiences, but those attempts used web technology but were not of the web. Um, you couldn't send a link to somebody in the same way that you can 
just generally and know that whatever device they're on, they would be able to interact with that. Um, with that. So like you can't send a link to an Adobe Air app or a PhoneGap application, but you can with a progressive web app and know that somebody will be able to have some sort of experience on that device. Now, despite the fact that there were these 10 definitions, even people who have developed progressive web apps don't quite know what the definition means. So Ben Halperin wrote about how he had just shipped a progressive web app and asked the question, like, what the heck is a progressive web app? Like, he shipped one and he still didn't know. And, and I, I'm sorry to say to my friends at Google, but I think they're partly to blame for this uh, because the first time that they started talking about progressive web apps on their developer site, they basically had the same 10 definitions as Francis and Alex. Um, but then a year later, they narrowed it down to six. And these six aren't the part of the original 10, um, but they're actually really good. Like instant loading and fast are actually the things that I think are key, and we'll talk more about that. Add to home screen, secure, push notifications, responsive. Like these are the things that I think are actually the big difference. But that wasn't enough. A year later, it got narrowed down to reliable, fast, and engaging. I'm like, okay. Not sure I know what that means. I mean, these are all good things, but I'm not sure what they mean. A year after that, at the Chrome Dev Summit, um, they added integrated. So now it's fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging. Uh, I'm not entirely certain what integrated means. Uh, um, I, I don't even know like, what distinguishes this. Like, is Craigslist a progressive web app now? Because it's fast, it's reliable, it's engaging. Um, it might not be integrated. I'm not certain. Um, but the great thing is, now they've got an acronym, right? It's now FIRE, right? I just want to burn it up. Um, so so I, think, I think that this is part of the confusion. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think that that confusion and, and that buzz is OK. But it can be confusing when you're trying to figure out what it means um, from a building perspective. Thankfully. Jeremy Keith sort of came back and, and looked at it the same way that um, Ethan Marcotte did with responsive web design. Um, and actually, I guess it was something that Alex had written a few years ago, but that people had kind of lost in the shuffle. And that a PWA is simply a website enhanced with three things, HTTPS, a service worker, and a manifest file. That's it. Like, that's the technical definition. You meet those three things, you've got a progressive web app. Um, that means that the range of progressive web apps are huge. Right? Like, it could be something that feels just like a website, or it could be something that feels very, very different. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on these specifically. I just want to, to point out, again, that the service worker is the key for how this all happens. Um, uh, as was spoke about this morning, um, it gives us the fine-grained control to talk about what gets put in the cache um, versus what we go out to the network for and able to make decisions um, to either grab something from the cache and then go to the network or go to the network and then go to the cache. And like we get the control that we've never had. And that that leads to um, performance boons. So Google did some studies where they looked at sites that had um, service workers and those that didn't have service workers. So this is desktop. And then they're looking at first paint time distribution. Um, and so the, what we want is more tall bars to the left. Um, this is without the service worker. And then with the service worker, we get um, a much, much better experience. As a matter of fact, there's a whole bunch of people who are getting nearly instantaneous experiences because of service workers. Um, we can sort of see the distribution, oops, went past for mobile, very similar. Um, not quite as dramatic, um, which is kind of expected because we've got devices that aren't quite as fast, but um, we can do quite a bit here. I, I wanted to, to share this bit about um, sort of Google measuring this because uh, my own experience actually trying to measure service workers has been really hard, and I'm hoping that some of you all can solve that. Um, Measuring your own service worker, particularly from a synthetic perspective, I think is really difficult. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that where, um, like if you, if you think about sort of browsing the web, we already have um, the disk cache and the browser's memory cache. And so really where the service worker is going to have the biggest impact is in situations where somebody visits your site and then there's like a week in between that visit and their next visit. 
And because a service worker allows us to explicitly say what should be around, like that second visit, which otherwise there will be nothing in the memory, um, nothing in the disk cache, um, the service worker cache is still there. And so we get that instantaneous experience again. But simulating that is much more difficult. Um, the second thing is, is that even in using some of the tools that we're commonly using, like web page test, uh, currently web page test doesn't actually tell us whether um, a, a second load, right, like the reload where we might see stuff coming from the service worker, it doesn't tell us whether it's coming from memory, from disk cache, or from service worker. So we can tell that there's some impact, but we can't isolate that impact to the service worker. Um, so what that's meant for us is that we've really been looking at sort of user data over time to see the impact of service workers on customer sites. Um, it's also challenging, I will just also add this note, to A-B test um, PWAs um, because uh, like scope on service workers can't be easily constrained to like URL parameters. And if you're using that for an A-B test, um, which we were, uh, you then end up with the service worker actually making the whole site faster, um, which is not, uh, which is great, except that now your A is faster and your B is faster, which isn't what you're going for. Um, but service workers are awesome, like, despite the fact that I'm having trouble measuring them, like, we do see the data in the long term on them. Um, and service workers are also key for providing offline experiences and push notifications. It's not just about performance. So again, uh, Progressive Web is a website that's been enhanced with HTTPS, a service worker, and a manifest file, but they can be much more. Um, I think the reason why people are really excited is because they do allow us to build the sorts of experiences that we normally think of as, as only something you can do with a um, native application. I want to show you a quick video that Google did that I think does a good job of describing this. <laughs> The only thing that evolves faster than technology is our expectations. We want everything. Better, easier, now. Suddenly, downloading an app feels like it takes forever. And in many parts of the world, data is still at a premium, with one megabyte costing up to 5% of a monthly wage. Let's face it though, until now, the alternative to native apps hasn't been great. But that was then. Progressive Web Apps can now deliver mobile web experiences with a native look and feel, offering features like real-time push notifications, adding a site to your home screen so you can easily jump back to it with a single tap, even when you're offline. Plus the ability to make quick payments on the go. And all from your browser. This is the next generation of the mobile web. So what are we waiting for? Let's go and build something great. Yeah, right? Like, who doesn't want to, like, have build a website, build a progressive web app, and then like have horses running down the beach <laughs> in a sunset. Like that is a promise. I promise you, you build a progressive web app, that's gonna happen. Everything's gonna be magical. Which brings me to my next point, um, that the hype can be a bit of a turnoff. Um, and it was for me, the first time I encountered progressive web apps, I didn't understand what the big deal was. Uh, I'd been um, following uh, app cache and then service workers, and so I knew service workers were an improvement over the pain that we had had with app cache. Um, there have been versions of manifest files for years in mobile. Um, so really, like, it wasn't that much different. And I didn't realize how important this distinction was until I was at a marketing conference, and I was on a panel, and somebody asked a question, and for whatever reason, the question made me think about progressive web apps, and I mentioned them in passing. And then I got you know, three or four follow-up questions from the audience about it, and then follow-up questions after the panel about progressive web apps. And I realized that this audience of digital marketers were suddenly really excited about the web. And I had expected, I was on the panel with a bunch of other people who were talking about native applications, I'd expected like, myself to be the person that nobody was like, oh, whatever, web, right? Like, tell us about the native apps. 
Um, and I realized that there's something really powerful in a name. Um, in the same way in which naming sort of the techniques for responsive web design helped us sort of coalesce around it, something very similar happens with progressive web apps. Francis Berryman has written about the fact that the name isn't for those of us in this room. Um, the name is, like, people get really hung up on whether it should be progressive web apps or progressive websites, and they get, there's just a whole bunch of discussion that happens around whether we should really be talking about it as a big deal. Um, and the point that she makes is that it's really a name for your organization to get them to look at the web in a new light. Um, and so I think um, it's important for us to use the hype, right? Like this is an opportunity to get people to pay attention to the web again and to get them to think about performance. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how that's, that's manifested on sites in, the, in, in a little bit. Um, uh, Jeremy Keith wrote about how it's important to use the right language for the right audience. If you're talking to business people, tell them about the return on investment you get from progressive web apps. If you're talking to marketing people, tell them about the experiential benefits of progressive web apps. But if you're talking to developers, tell them that a progressive web app is a website served over HTTPS with a service worker and a manifest file. All right. So then comes the question, like, do we even need a progressive web app? For this, I think organizations have to ask two questions, like, does it have a website? Well, yeah, then you probably would benefit from a progressive web app because they are just web best practices, right? They are the way that we should be building webs, and they, they will allow us to build things that are faster and create better experiences. And then the second question is, does your organization make money on your website via e-commerce, advertising, or some other method? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you probably definitely need a progressive web app for all of the reasons that we track on PWA stats. The thing is, though, if you start to sort of evangelize a progressive web app inside your organization and you're trying to get, convince them to do it, and, and maybe you're even using it as a way to get them to pay attention to performance, you're probably going to run into some FUD, right? This fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So I want to arm you with a few things to take into those conversations. The first thing that people will say is, hey, we don't need a progressive web app because we already have a native application. And I don't see, I don't see these things as in conflict. Um, Progressive Web Apps allows to reach people who don't have native apps um, installed. Um, you know, not all of our customers have Progressive Web or have native applications installed. 100% of our potential customers don't have our native application installed, and even people who have the native application installed may be on their desktop computer where they don't have access to the the native application. So a website is oftentimes customers' first interaction with the company. It's the beginning of that funnel. And providing a better web experience will mean increased revenue. It could even mean more native application installs, right? If somebody visits your site and it's terrible, how are you going to convince them to install that native application? The second thing that people oftentimes talk about is how the web can't do, and like they'll just they'll come up with whatever it is they think they can't do. And sometimes this is true, right? Like, um, if you're going to do something with HealthKit, you really need an iOS native application in order to get data from whatever it is you're doing into HealthKit. Um, but oftentimes, it's more like what I saw in this Mobile Marketer article, which is a really great article about progressive web apps, but then in the middle of it just drops this one sentence without any evidence that PWAs do not support the camera, GPS, and fingerprint sensors on phones. The camera, finger, GPS, and fingerprint sensors. OK, three things. Um, Instagram has a progressive web app. Last time I checked, like, they're kind of big into using the camera. Um, so the article might not have been right about that. Um, also, GPS, like, we've had access to geolocation information on phones since iPhone, not iOS, iPhone OS 3.0 in 2009. Like, I can't visit websites without them asking for my location, right? Like, I, I wonder if this author had ever spent any time on the mobile web. Um, and then about the fingerprint sensor, here's the thing. These socks that I'm wearing, these socks are proof that you can use a fingerprint sensor on the web. Because I was writing, I'm writing this book, and I'm trying to take a screenshot of the payment request API on J.Crew's website, and I forgot that the home button is also the fingerprint sensor. And the home button is what you use to take a screenshot. And so I accidentally bought socks. <laughs> the fingerprint sensor works on the web so well 
that I bought these socks. For those in the back who can't see, they're actually Groundhog socks, Groundhog Day socks. Uh, in the United States, we've got this thing where um, February 2nd, uh, the groundhog, they come out, and if the groundhog sees its shadow, then that means um, six more weeks of winter or something like that. It's, it's kind of silly, um, but it was made into a pretty good movie. More importantly, my son was born on Groundhog's Day, um, so I might have wanted the socks anyways, but I was not ready to buy them at that moment. <laughs> As a matter of fact, like, I went back, I still had to take a screenshot, and I had just bought those socks, so I went and I found another pair to put into the cart, just, like, I had picked socks just in case this happened, um, and, uh, and then I, like, I tried to take photos with gloves on, but that didn't, or screenshots with gloves on, but that didn't work, because now the iPhone's button is, like, it has to detect your finger, um, and then I, like, did it with my pinky, so that my, my pinky fingerprint wasn't recognized, so I could take the screenshot. And then I picked up the phone, and I tapped on the thumbnail with my left finger, left thumb, and then I realized that my right thumb was sitting on the home button again. Um, thankfully, that time I didn't buy socks. It, apparently, I had selected the, the thumbnail quick enough. My point isn't about like fingerprint sensors, but just that the web can do more than we oftentimes think it can. And over the last decade, browser makers have added a lot of features to browsers. And so oftentimes what happens is we go, we've got a project, and maybe we've got an opportunity to use the camera to do something. And then we're like, oh, it's not quite there yet. And, and that feature gets killed off of that project. And then we don't go back. We don't realize that that has changed, that browsers have added that functionality in. Another bit of feedback that um, organizations will oftentimes have is that iOS doesn't support progressive web apps. Um, this is no longer true. As of earlier this year, um, Safari added uh, service workers. Um, and even if this weren't the case, I think it's really interesting that progressive web apps would continue to work on older devices because they're built with progressive enhancement. right? Like, this is just added functionality for better browsers. It's not something that precludes people from using it. As a matter of fact, uh, building progressive web apps before iOS supported service workers, companies were actually seeing increased conversion on iOS devices when they built their progressive web app. So AliExpress um, saw 104% increase in conversion for new users, 82% increase in for iOS. WeGo saw a 50% increase in uh, iOS conversion, a 35% increase in Android or in average iOS session time. Um, Washington Post saw a 5x increase in user engagement, and I asked them if there was any difference between Android and iOS, and they said that they didn't see anything. All of the all of those data points are before Service Worker was available in um, in iOS, and I think that the reason why this happens is because of performance, right? Like. It's not that PWA stats is just, you know, like borrowed the idea from, from uh, WPO stats. It's actually just another version of WPO stats, right? Like we're really talking about the benefits of performance when it comes to PWAs. Um, but it's a way, so because of this, I've got to say, like I've got a couple of friends who have looked at this data and then said, well, this means that progressive web apps actually aren't making any difference in performance, right? Like, like you can't attribute it to progressive web apps if we're seeing this increase in performance on devices that don't have service workers. But I would argue that if it weren't for progressive web apps, these projects would have never happened. Those organizations wouldn't have spent the time really looking at performance that they did. So in many ways, progressive web apps are a Trojan horse for performance. They're a way to get organizations to pay attention to them that they haven't in the past. All right, so everybody gets really excited. They're like, yes, let's go do this. Let's build a progressive web app. We still got the problem of deciding what it means. And I like to look at it with these five factors. I think that these are the, the sort of, at the moment, the five factors that organizations will be making decisions on. And for each one of them, they're, they're like really simple implementations and there's really complex ones. I don't have time to go through all five, so I'm gonna focus on these three, making it feel like an app, offline mode, and then the things that I consider sort of beyond PWAs. So making it feel like an app. This is interesting because um, Everybody will say that this is important. Chris Coyier on CSS Tricks did this survey where he asked people um, if distinguishing between apps and sites was important. And 72% of people said, yes, they're different things with different concerns. 
And I, I would encourage you to go read the article and then, more importantly, read the comments. Because in the comments, there's not a single person who agrees with another person about what that distinction is. <laughs> it's important, but they can't agree. Um, as Jeremy Keith says, like obscenity and brunch, web apps can be described but not defined. And the reason I bring this up is because if you're in that room with all these people with all these different roles and they're trying to make decisions about what they're going to build from a progressive web app, you can be certain that making it feel like an app is going to be something that everybody thinks is important and nobody is going to have the same vision in their head about what that means. Um, instead, I think it's really helpful to start narrowing down to characteristics that we might look at. So how much do we want to make it feel like a native application? And in particular, I mean, how much do we want it to feel like the native language of that application? We can do things like define um, the system fonts, the default system fonts. And I'm not talking about the sort of fonts that are in the browser, but I'm actually talking about um, you know, the actual system font, San Francisco being used on iOS, um, that sort of thing, and the design language. And so we could actually have our applications sort of ape those native conventions and try to fit in in that way. But then how many platforms do we do that for? And do we do that for desktop, right? Like we haven't really been worrying about a being Mac and Windows, um, and do we jump every time the platform changes? So I think that it's much better for us to like to you know define something that feels right. Um, this is a PhoneGap application called Tripcase. Um, uh, full disclosure, we helped work on it, but we didn't do any of the design work, and I think that that's actually where this app shines. It feels great on iOS. It feels great on Android. It's basically the same design. Um, it doesn't feel iOS or Android. It just feels mobily, and it works. And it works better than the native app that is its competitor. Another thing we can do is we can have a more immersive experience. Um, this could be part of what it means to have something feel like an app. Um, so in the manifest file, we can actually declare what display mode we want when somebody adds it to their home screen, when they've got that icon on their home screen. And so we can go everywhere from having the full browser Chrome to having none of the browser Chrome and display full screen. But that simple declaration of display full screen has a lot of ramifications that people don't necessarily realize. Um, we're spoiled by our browsers. We don't think about all the things that browsers provide for us. Um, inside the warm comforts of the browser, we have things like the status bar, the address bar, um, navigation bar. Um, we've also got things like find and page, downloads, um, also the ability to print, to share, to email. When we move out of those warm comforts and we actually go out into the rough wild of what it was essentially to build native applications, where we have to add all that stuff back in. And even something as simple as a back button can be more difficult than it first seems. Um, a lot of apps have a hierarchy to them, right? The home page, maybe product category page, product page, then up to the category page, and then back to product page. Um, and so the back button sort of follows that hierarchy. Um, but the web isn't linear in that way. And so it's actually possible to end up in a situation where somebody comes to your web page from search results. And then inside the web page, you might have a back button. And that back button can look exactly like the back button that the browser provides, but they go to different locations. In which case, like, maybe we don't even have that button. I found this really fun. Um, I found this fun scenario when I was working on the book where I could actually, uh, on this Polymer uh, site, I could press the back button and get to the category page, and then also press the forward button and get to the category page. So no matter, all roads lead to the category page, right? Like, no matter which way I go. Um, there is a display mode media query that you can use to make decisions based on what display mode you're in. Um, but I think what's really important here is that in the same way in which when we started doing responsive design, it meant that all of us had to re relearn what it meant to design and to build things because we were, we were dealing with a bunch of different screen sizes and a bunch of different devices. Now, in addition to that continuum of screen sizes, we've also got a continuum of a context because not everybody is actually going to install your progressive web app to the home screen. And if they don't do that, you're not going to have that display mode. Um, but the reality is that everyone's going to install your progressive web app because the moment somebody visits your site, the service worker gets installed behind the scenes and they get every feature of the, the progressive web app that you could have. 
Another thing we can do is we can have fast and fluid experiences. Um, and this is partially the things that we talk about normally at performance conferences, but it's also about providing things like immediate feedback, right? Getting designers excited about um, using animation to help people understand what's happening. Um, using animation and transitions, which are possible in some progressive web apps to actually enable us to have um, things that, that support wayfinding and make it feel faster. So in WeGo, as somebody navigates through the application, um, things slide in from the right, right? Sort of reinforcing that application hierarchy. Um, yesterday, it was mentioned the idea that we could use service workers to store placeholder images. And this is a really, really great thing, both from a performance perspective and to avoid the sort of jumping of pages. And with service workers, we can actually be certain that those assets are going to be available to us so that we can avoid that and we can have faster loading pages. And then I want to talk just a moment about AppShell. Um, and it's been brought up a couple of times. Um, and it does make a difference in the perceived performance of web pages. Um, but I'm also going to talk about why you should be cautious. But first, like, it's great, because now we've got something that is stored um, offline, is available to instantly load. Um, and we can actually see this. The Washington Post, for a while, was running side by side their progressive web app and their, their mobile website that wasn't a progressive web app. So it, was, it gave me the opportunity to compare the two of them. Um, and I've got this video I'm going to show you, and it's going to go pretty quickly, so I want to describe it ahead of time. One of the things that you'll notice is that the, the video on the right, which is the PWA with the app shell. Oh, and by the way, I should note, these are all on iOS before iOS had the service worker, which I think was an interesting point of comparison. So the, app, the PWA with app shell will feel like it loads faster, but if you pay really close attention, the actual um, load time of the one on the right, or the one on the left that doesn't have app shell completes loading um, faster than the PWA does. So, ready? Here we go. Like, it, there's something really nice about the app shell experience where there's always something on the screen. Like, you're, you just, um, like, it feels like things are happening much more quickly. Now, I mentioned that I, I have a little bit of a warning about this because, um, Using App Shell oftentimes means that you're building a single page application. Uh, Paul Kinlan has actually written a little bit about um, using, um, uh, using uh, streams as a way to sort of replicate App Shell without doing single page applications, which is kind of an interesting way to possibly do stuff without having to take on all of the front loading JavaScript that um, single page applications do. But I, I have this warning because, like, on the one hand, like, this is really great. Like, you get that really great experience. But on the other hand, like, as Steve was saying yesterday, like, JavaScript's the main culprit for this stuff. And what happens for a lot of organizations is that when they try to go to App Shell, they end up going to um, JavaScript frameworks that aren't, aren't well suited for mobile um, or JavaScript frameworks that, um, that claim to be well suited for mobile but that Facebook um, doesn't actually use for their mobile website. Um, so, you know, like React might not be the fastest thing. Um, anyway, so PWAs don't necessarily need to be a single page application. There's no reason that it has to be. Our progressive web app um, on our site, our site's built on WordPress. It's primarily about articles. Um, basically, it made sense for it to be on WordPress. We built it really, really fast. Then we added a service worker, it was even faster. Like, doing all the work to make it a spa just didn't make sense. And then finally, I'm not sure whether feeling like an app should even be your goal, right? Like, your customers aren't going to care whether it's more of an app or a site, right? They're just going to care about having an exceptional experience. So make sure the things you build are fast and feel good. Again, I talked about this before, but this is sort of the continuum that I see, right? Like, we could have something that feels like an app that's just a website with performance improvements all the way to something that's a full screen application using app shell and has native design language and changes between all the different design languages. And depending on what you decide to do, like the scope of your progressive web app will change quite dramatically. So for offline mode, um, for offline mode, we oftentimes think about it um, kind of in two sort of extremes. The first extreme is, is sort of the idea of using it for performance and offline fallback. And this is what we should all be using um, progressive or service workers for, right? To cache things, to make things faster, um, to provide offline fallbacks, and hopefully even provide offline fallbacks. This is like an opportunity for creativity. Trivago's offline fallback page um, 
allows you to do a maze, and they found that uh, people returned more once they put this maze in place, so they'd have network interruptions and the person could continue to interact with the web page. Um, but when we do this, we end up with a lot of hidden challenges, even in just addressing uh, performance. Um, uh, because if we haven't in the past had to worry about cache management or build processes, or like, and there are organizations where that's the case, like that's not part of what they've done on a regular basis. The moment you add a service worker, um, it's going to require you to start thinking about cache and validation. Um, the moment you start messing around with these, um, uh, with service workers, you really probably need some sort of process for, for building um, pieces out. And if you've got a site that takes 30 seconds to load on a 3G connection, um, adding a service worker and a manifest file will technically make you a PWA, but you won't get the benefits that we see on pwastats.com. So there's like a minimum threshold of performance that we need. Um, and then in addition, like you could run into stuff like we did, where um, we bumped into don't, to, um, a quota exceeded error for our service worker, um, which is really amazing, right? So like we bumped into this thing where all of our storage for the service worker had been exceeded on some of the devices we were testing on, um, which like wouldn't seem that like that big a deal, except it was 15 thumbnail images, <laughs> like, and they were they were actually thumbnail images. They weren't like poorly compressed thumbnail images or way too big. They were actually properly sized images, and what we ran into was that. Um, that there are times where 7K is equal to 7 megs from a service worker perspective. Um, because of some security issues, when service workers have to cache opaque responses, things that aren't being shared over cores, um, they go into the, into the service worker cache as taking up 7 megs on Chrome no matter what their actual size was originally. And they do that to prevent leaks of information about this. So that meant that those 15 images were over 100 megs in the service worker cache. They weren't really taking up 100 megs on the person's device, but for all intents and purposes, Chrome thought, okay, you're done, right? We couldn't even get through a product category page listing before we ran out of service worker cache. Um, so if this happens, uh, like for the first time ever, because we've got images on a CDN, we actually needed to add cross-origin attributes to our image elements, right? Not that big a deal, but wow, like what a difference. Like now we're actually getting to cache the things we want to cache. Um, so I just wanted to point out that it takes a little bit to get service workers right. But once we've got them, we could do some really fun stuff, right? So we could, um, like on our site, what we do is we don't know what somebody's going to want to read offline. Uh, eventually, we'll probably sort of have the ability for somebody to actually explicitly say what they want. But in the meantime, if you visit a page offline that um, you previously had visited, we display it, right? And then if you go to a page that you haven't been to, we provide an offline indicator. Um, if you do something like this, and particularly if you've got information that is sensitive or time sensitive in some way, you should let people know how old it is. Um, and then one of the things that I think is interesting about sort of having the ability to put stuff in the cache and start thinking about offline is that um, we tend to think of pages as either available or not available, but actually it can be portions of pages that aren't available. So um, Trivago does actually a really good job of this where um, you know, like you can be scrolling through the list of hotels, and you may have information for three of the four tabs on a hotel. But when you tap to one of them, it says, "Hey, like you're offline, and we don't have this information." So they've actually built sort of offline indicators in portions of the page, which I think is really neat. We can let people choose what they want to have offline. Uh, Financial Times does a good job of this. Um, they also pre-cache each day's edition which is great, particularly because they give people um, transparency and control over what is cached. And this is really critical. We can't make a bunch of assumptions about what somebody wants available offline. Um, there's also some really neat stuff uh, that allows us to now do background sync, which is something we couldn't do in the past. Um, and I skipped past the video on accident. But um, so uh, we've got the ability here in this um, offline Wikipedia that Jake Archibald created. Um, you go to a page, it's taking a long time to download. Um, so pop up a little notice that says, hey, do you want us to load it in the background and then let you know when it's done? Um, says yes, closes the browser, closes it entirely. Then a bit later, receives a push notification, 
letting him know that it's actually now available, and then opens up the page and it's been loaded in the background, right? This is really, really powerful stuff that we weren't able to do in the past. When it comes to offline interactivity, at minimum, we should prevent people from editing like Slack does if we know that they are offline. Like we can know this, um, and we can save them from the sorts of experiences that Remy Sharp had recently, where he was writing a blog post in a hospital, and then all of a sudden lost all of his work. Right? This used to be just the price we paid for filling in a web form on the web. Right? Like you start filling in a web form, you take too long, you lose your network connection, you lose everything you've written. If this happens now, it's an indication that the development team hasn't done the work it needs to help users because there's no reason that they can't have this, they can't at least be told that they're offline and possibly even store that information for syncing later. Um, we end up using Workbox a lot with service workers, um, really great for helping us uh, build things out more quickly. Um, I just want to point out something that Alex Russell had said, um, actually when he was tech reviewing my book, he said that like, the goal isn't offline, offline is just a special case of flakiness. Um, progressive web apps and service workers give you the ability to be reliable for your users. That's the advantage across all connection states, even online. So again, we've got the ability to cache for performance, to cache for interactivity, anywhere between those. Um, and depending on what you do, like that could be really simple. Um, or if you're trying to like have distributed editing offline, um, that's like a hard computer science problem. And I will thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so finally, like the things that are beyond progressive web apps. These are things that aren't technically part of progressive web app definition, but are oftentimes thought of in the same breadth. So for example, um, AMP, right? Well. I've, I've got some opinions about AMP. <laughs> um, like many people, I think if maybe we built things faster from the beginning, AMP wouldn't exist. And um, I applaud Google for attempting to sort of bring it into standards, which is great. Um, but I'm still worried about a bifurcated web. Um, but oftentimes, organizations have to use AMP. So if you're going to use AMP, you can actually have AMP install your service worker so that when somebody gets to your progressive web app, they have a faster experience right off the bat. Um, so this is something you can do and should do. Um, I also think that there are these APIs like the auto login with the credential management API that are things that a lot of organizations aren't doing but probably should be. So Pinterest does this, and you launch Pinterest PWA, and like within seconds, I'm into the application and ready to go. Right? Like I don't have to type in my username, my password. It's just boom, I'm in. Um, Another example of that, the payment request API, right? Which I mentioned earlier, which is great. Um, very, very fast, so fast that you can accidentally buy socks. Um, I just want to pause for a moment and say that we don't think of these two things as something that we commonly talk about at performance conferences. But if we're really talking about perceived performance, I, I would argue that the perceived performance of going to a web page and going through a checkout process where I have to like, fill out that and then select guest checkout and then fill in my shipping information and then go to the next page and then fill out my payment information, that the perceived performance of that is crap when compared to being able to buy something with my fingerprint, right? And if your organization is still ha using web forms instead of using things like payment request API to allow people to to purchase stuff and purchase stuff quickly, they are going to feel your site as fast, even if web page test says that it's fast. Or they're going to think it's slow, even if web page test says that it's fast. So again, we've got this ability to make decisions on what we want to do in this space. So the team gets together at this point and is asking themselves, like, how do we put together that plan? Um, and this is the great thing about progressive web apps. They're progressive because we can build them progressively. So when we built our progressive web app, um, we knew we were doing a redesign. We launched with HTTPS and HTTP2. A couple months later, we added a service worker and a simple fallback. A little bit after that, we added um, better fallback support and more advanced service worker thing, improved font loading. Um, then we added push notifications. And then a month after that, I finally got around to saying, hey, we've got a progressive web app. What's great is that each one of these points, like the website got better for users, um, and we're continuing to make improvements. And so I think a lot of organizations will end up doing something very similar, right? Where they sit down and they define what that ideal progressive web app is, and they decide where they fall on these sort of five factors, depending on what makes sense for your organization. Um, 
Then make sure you benchmark and plan to measure the improvements. And I know that that's something that we commonly think of in this community, but I think that it's even more important when you're doing a progressive web app project because eventually you're going to need to interact with other teams and you're gonna to want to sort of prove that your effort is something that's worthwhile for them in, um, in terms of the improvements that they see. And if you actually start seeing increases in conversion, all of a sudden you'll have executives on your side when it comes to being able to convince them to sort of stop what they're doing and put your project at the top. Um, so you do this planning and definition work, then maybe you have to address some technical debt if your site doesn't have like that baseline of performance. Um, then we can do a baseline progressive web app, making things faster, allowing people to add it to the home screen. Then I'd encourage you to look at like maybe some front end improvements that don't have to require interacting with other groups in the organization. Um, not that the other groups are bad, just that more people means more time. And then finally, you can get to like larger initiatives like the payment request API that probably means interacting with like business in terms of changing the way that we do payments. The great thing about this is that if you put together a timeline like this, um, you don't have to wait till the end and bundle it all up and ship a binary to an app store and then wait for the app store to improve it. Instead, you can ship improvements all along the way. You can do incremental improvements to your website on the path to having a progressive web app. And this is what gets me really excited, is that every step on the path to a progressive web app makes sense on its own. And if you haven't started yet, I really encourage you to start working on a progressive web app. Like Steve said, I've got a book coming out on Monday. Um, it's about progressive web apps, and it's really about how the team makes decisions about what they're going to build. Um, there are other books that teach you like how to get into the code of service workers. Um, Jeremy Keith's got one. Dean Hume's got one. There are a lot of good books on that. That's not my book. Um, so if you're looking for that, you should go somewhere else. But if you want something that actually helps people make decisions about how to use these features and what they should build, that's what it is. It comes out on Monday. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, I really like the roadmap uh, slide that you put up at the end. And in fact, that was one of the questions that came through was along the lines of, do I have to like do a complete rewrite or is there an iterative approach? And certainly, you know, like you pointed out, you could hopefully you're already on HTTPS. Yeah, uh, but you could add manifest, you could add service. Well, one of our clients wasn't, and it took six months to make the transition. So, like, I, I no longer think of that as, like, a, just a, a known immediate thing. Um, yeah, I, I think it depends on where you're at and where you want to get to. Um, so, you know, we've had, we've had um, a couple of clients where their existing, like I said, the existing site took 30 seconds to load on, um, on 3G, uh, fast 3G. Um, they had sites that had sort of been hacked to be responsive, so they were actually using JavaScript to move things around in the DOM in order to make it responsive. And, um, and because of that, there were actually touch targets that were too small. And like, we basically went to them and were like, you know, we really need to redesign things and like clean house. Like you just have, you've got way too much stuff going on and we can't, like we can't reasonably incrementally improve this. Um, other organizations we've talked to, like they've got a pretty good baseline of stuff, and so now it's like, okay, now we're adding the service worker, and then you know, like we'll do push notifications down the road, and then we'll gradually do the additional pieces um, based on what what they think will give them the biggest return on investment. And I certainly thought until you pointed out, I don't think I've. Is this a brand new talk? I don't think I've seen this talk before. Until you pointed out here, I definitely thought PWA and meant spa. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting, you know, I realize now that that's not the case, but do you think there are even more benefits that making your PWA a spa will bring? It depends. Um, so, I, I mean, so like we've got, we've, we've worked with a few e-commerce companies and um, one of the e-commerce companies, like their backend infrastructure is one where they don't have access to APIs. Like, their path to converting to a spa is much, much longer than, like, we might think of in this room. Um, 
And the reality is, is that I, I, like, while we can get some nice transitions and we can get um, even faster behavior once the spa is loaded, um, there's so much that can be done to have a faster and better experience without making that transition um, that like, if, if an organization isn't well suited to making that transition, I would not make that a barrier to implementing service workers and being able to implement the sort of features of PWA um, because that can be, that transition actually could be bigger than anything else they need to do from a PWA perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and the other piece of the reason why I'm cautious about it is because um, I see a lot of organizations decide that they need to be a spa um, and now all of a sudden they start making a bunch of bad decisions when it comes to JavaScript. So now the whole JavaScript framework has to download before they're not doing any sort of server-side rendering. Like the whole JavaScript framework has to load. Their time to interactives are going way up because they're adding a lot of JavaScript to handle um, routing and everything else that the spa needs. Um, they've picked frameworks that aren't performant on mobile devices, and um, you know, I like some of our more popular frameworks aren't performant on mobile devices, um, and so. Consequently, what ends up happening is, is that they end up with something that feels faster maybe for like second visits or third visits, but like that first visit is so important and they're like they're missing really the boat. Is. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of other great questions, but we're over time. Oh, no so problem. hopefully people can hit you up at the break. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.